Welcome to DockerCon Live 2020. So in this talk, we're going to be talking a lot about game, in-game servers, and uh, why we feel containerizing your game servers is, uh, can help you make the best multiplayer experience for your players. So uh, I am, uh, my name is Raymond Arifianto. Hi, uh, I am the VP of uh, tech in a company called Excelbyte. And with me, I have... Hi, I'm Mark Mandel. Nice to see you all. I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud, working specifically on gaming. Today, we're going to be talking about containers and how they can solve game server workload problems. So before we get started, um, let's talk a little bit about what is a game server. So if any of you have played sort of real-time, fast-paced multiplayer games, you may have been playing on a dedicated game server. So you might have played something like Fortnite or Valorant or Overwatch or Rocket League, like these super fast-based multiplayer games. And that's what we're considering when we're talking about these types of workloads and the solution therein that's required, which is a, a game server in this case. So what is a game server or, or potentially a dedicated game server? So basically, it's a full in-memory simulation of what's happening inside a game hosted somewhere on the internet. All players are going to connect to that dedicated game server, and they're going to be sending across like things like, hey, I'm moving forward. Maybe I'm firing rockets on my car. Maybe I'm running in a certain direction. And it's up to that dedicated game server to basically run the full simulation of all the physics, the player actions, the inputs, and tell all the players that are therefore connected, hey, this player has done this, this player has won a point, this player has you know, fallen over or something like that, and be that central authority in a game to determine exactly what's happening inside that game. Right. So, so why? Like, you know, like why, why do games use game servers? Um, the, the first one is for the better player uh, connectivity. Uh, you know, back in when, when a lot of games are still using peer-to-peer, -peer, which, you know, a lot of games still do, right? Uh, in peer-to-peer, -peer, you are establishing connections directly between players to players. Um, and, and there's this thing called NAT, right? The, the network address translation that, that sits in your router, uh, that, that allows you to, uh, have multiple devices in your, in your, in your home. Uh, it, it kind of does the network address translation, uh, the private IP and public IP. Uh, but what that means is that, like, sometimes when a player using is behind a strict net and then another player is also behind a strict net, they cannot play together, right? So, uh, so that, that's, that's not great uh, player experience. So if you are using game server, as long as you can hit the internet, basically you can uh, connect to the game server. Um, the other one is fairness. Um, I mean, like, you, if, if you played games before, I mean, like, there, there is there are a lot of, uh, software solutions, anti-cheat, and all that to to curb uh, cheating experiences, and and ultimately, if if the one of the player acts as a host, like Mark said, is like the one that determines uh, who gets the player shot, who gets the kill, and things like that. Essentially, it's not exactly fair if if the person is actually running some kind of cheating software or bots and things like that. Uh, the third one is about uh, control of system resources, right? So again, like if if one of the player uh, that may be running in a console or running in a PC that, that may have different uh, capabilities, right? Uh, specs like CPUs and memories and all that. Um, it, makes, it makes your job a lot harder if you need to actually consider all those variations um, of, of what the spec is running of, of the, the server, of the, 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 the console that ended up running the server logic. And the last one is just the fact that, like, if you have, if you are building a cross-platform game, it's like you can't always have to use a dedicated server because uh, the map code between different platforms is is not compatible. So, uh, so yeah. Cool. So this sounds great in theory, but there are certain challenges in managing game servers. So as we were talking about fast-paced, real-time action games, um, and all our players want to be able to play on it, this means that you're going to require to have a global footprint. Usually these games can often have a latency requirement of 50 milliseconds or under. So you need to have game servers in places that are 50 milliseconds or under wherever your players are. And that means, yeah, you're going to have to place them around the world. On top of that, most game servers often load up gigabytes of data when they start. So like map data, player data, what their assets look like, all that kind of information. And that can take anywhere up to a minute to start, which is quite a while. Uh, probably many of us are, are very familiar with like web servers coming up and they'll come up in seconds. That's great. 
when you have minute startup times, you need to make sure that you actually have a pool of warm game servers ready at any given point in time for players to play to mitigate that slow startup time. Finally, there's one really kind of almost unique aspect of game servers in that they have this in-memory persistent data. So when you have this warm set of game servers ready to go, before players join, right, a game server, you can kill them. You know, you can, you can cut them off and if you need to scale down, totally fine. But as soon as you have players playing on a game server, you have in-memory persistent data of everything that's happening inside the game and you can no longer shut down that game server. So you need to be hyper aware of whether or not that game server has players on it. And if so, you can't shut that down. Otherwise people get really mad and they post horrible things on the internet and nobody wants that. Right, so what are the challenges in, in, in managing all these thousands of game servers? Because like, remember that game servers is, is is tied to the player session, right? I mean, like, so uh, for a very successful game, it's like they literally have thousands of game server processes that they have to manage. And um, if there's one takeaway from this, it's like if you manage this, it it does not bring you joy. It's not fun, right? So let's let's go through an example. This is actually a real life scenario that I've actually uh, experience, <laughs> um, right? So. Let's say that like I'm 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 working on a game and then like I, I need to use the game servers, right? So the first thing that I do is I need to figure out where to deploy the game servers to. Um, like Mark said, it's like the location of where the servers are running is needs to be close to your player base. So let's say that like I, I work out the deal with the hosting provider and I deploy out my servers in these bare metal machines. Um, all fine, everyone can connect, it's great. Uh, but one thing about game servers is that uh, if if you don't have enough game servers, then you cannot connect right, anymore because you're out of servers, uh, and then you cannot play, which is not great for players. Um, which can happen. Let's say that like your calculation based on the pre-order is 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 off, for instance. Right? So what do you do? Uh, the next thing you do is you would consider that's like oh, uh, since since requesting a new server from the bare metal provider, let's say like can take days, can take weeks, and we did it now. So you would go for a cloud VM, right? Which is which is great because that's what cloud VM is for, right? They are for elasticity. Um, you can you can spin up a new server very quickly, right? So so now you are deploying your server binaries in both the bare metal uh, data centers and also in the cloud right now. Um, but then next thing you know, you realize that like you have two different ways to to deploy things out to manage, right? Uh, you also are dealing with uh, different machine types, uh, different capabilities of the machines. Um, some have 16 gigabyte of RAM, some has uh, 8 gigabyte of RAM. So, like, so you kind of have to manage just like, well, how many servers can I run on this particular type? Um, and then you have, you multiply it by two, right, <laughs> at that point. Um, so now, okay, so now it's, it's, but it's fine. Like now, now it's working. And now obviously the next thing is like, we need to deploy out a new version of the server up, right? Uh, because we just released a title update or there's a bug and things like that. Right? And now you need to deploy out uh, not only the, the new binaries to the servers, but then like you also realize that like it, it may be expensive to run this thing. So you need, you want to institute some kind of auto scaling rules. Uh, and then you realize that the different regions have different auto scaling behaviors because the players in the different regions, if, if I'm, if I'm playing in US West, uh, people in Europe is sleeping, right? Um, so they all have different uh, uh, player peaks and all that, right? So you kind of have to consider that like every one of these regions in auto scale independently. Um, you need to, and then you start, like Mark said, it's like you cannot just simply kill all the servers and deploy a new one, right? You have to consider that like other players playing on it. So you have to consider about the game server lifecycle management, monitoring, rolling, deploy, and, and you kind of have to do that for every single providers that you're doing, which is, which can be hard. <laughs> now, uh, and this is our, this is where it's, where it's getting fun. Like we think that like, if you manage your game servers with containers, it can actually bring you joy. As a reminder, I'm sure that you are, uh, if you are watching this, uh, this presentation uh, in DockerCon, most likely you're very familiar with the benefits that Docker and uh, containerization provides, right? But the thing is that it, it it's it's all about portable, right? You know, like you're 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 creating something that is portable, that is predictable, it's immutable. You know that like if it works in one environment, it will work in another environment. 
uh, it's self-sufficient, it's flexible, and also just the fact that we have a, a huge number of people that's contributing to this, that's making this better with the standard tooling, uh, with the ecosystem is, is, is mature, right? Uh, there are a lot of patterns you can follow that just makes your life easier. Uh, okay, so now you might be thinking that's like, okay, awesome. So what you're saying is, uh, you know, we, I, I, I bought into the Docker stuff, like with the Docker containerization, uh, with all the benefits. Uh, I have a game server. Uh, how does this work, right? So let's let's start through some examples. Uh, first thing you want to do is create a U Unreal Engine for headless server. Headless server is basically without GP, right? It's a, it's the dedicated server. It's the game server. Uh, so first things first is like you 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 pick a target, which is the development server. Uh, you use the built-in tools from Unreal Engine four to to create the Linux package. Uh, and then from that Linux package, you, you create the Docker image uh, with the Docker file that we will go over after this. Uh, and you create the entry point, which is basically like the parameter of the server. Um, and then you push it to the Docker registry. Simple as that. And the Docker file is, it's, it's very, you know, it's very simple, right? It's basically, uh, you know, you, you take the image and then you copy the, there's always asset folder. There's always the bin folder. There's always you know, like, so you, you copy it out and then you, you know, just change the permission, and then you run it. Now, OK, cool. All right, so at this point, you have uh, your game server image on the Docker registry, right? But, but now comes the hard part, essentially. Like, how do you, how do you deploy it out to all the different uh, locations? And how do you manage it? How do you do auto scaling and things like that? So I'm glad you asked, right? Um... So how do you, yeah, how do you orchestrate game servers? Like, how do you build these, these warm sets of game servers? And like, how do you control them and manage them? So one way of doing that is an open source project called Agones, which I work on. And Agones is an open source library for hosting, running, and scaling, um, and managing dedicated game servers on top of Kubernetes. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Kubernetes. Um, and so Agones is essentially just a Kubernetes operator. Uh, it has its own custom resource definitions, such as fleets and game servers, um, as well as controller components to manage the life cycles in an appropriate way that makes sense for game servers, like we were talking about before, making sure they don't get shut down when players are on them, making sure they can auto scale appropriately in a way that makes sense for game servers so we're not disrupting player flow or anything like that as well. So as Ray was talking about previously, right, we had those bespoke sort of scripts that happened uh, that got built so that you can scale game servers on either on-prem or on the cloud. This replaces that because this is basically a solution that it can run anywhere a Kubernetes cluster can run. And as we all know, Kubernetes clusters can be run pretty much anywhere, which is kind of awesome. So since you can do that, this means then that you can run it on your own machine, maybe inside a QA cluster or your studios cluster, but also just wherever your players show up. And uh, I think Ray can also attest to this. Players show up in some weird places around the world because sometimes people just get really excited about playing your game and you need to make sure your infrastructure runs there. Why don't I show you a quick demo so you can see some of the features that Agones has, uh, and I can take you through them real quick. So I've already got set up uh, a standard Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's running on Google Kubernetes Engine. Here we have several nodes uh, sitting here waiting for stuff to be installed. But essentially, it is, it is empty as it currently stands. It's just standard Kubernetes, nothing special. So let's go ahead and install uh, Agones. Space, And what this is going to do is install the custom resource definitions and the required uh, controller components into this cluster. And then suddenly I'm going to be able to use Agonis, which should be really nice. So pretty simple to install. As you can see there, if I have a look at our pods in our namespace of Agonis system, uh, we can see now we have the required components up there running. We've got a controller and a bunch of other fun things there. Um, but what's cool now is that because Agonis is an extension of Kubernetes, I can now say get game servers, which is like a, a noun that Kubernetes didn't know about before, and it understands it. And here we don't have any, which is fine, um, but we're going to add some in a moment. So as we were talking about previously, we want to have this warm set of uh, game servers ready to go. In Agonis, we call this a fleet. Um, so if we go have a quick look. Uh, this is what a fleet configuration looks like. If you're familiar with deployments in Kubernetes, this probably looks very familiar. Uh, we have a game server specification. Uh, basically, a fleet is just how many of these game servers do we want. 
nothing more complicated than that. And I think Onus has auto scaling and other such stuff in it, but we're not going to talk about that too much today. Um, and here, what we're doing is we're going to run a game called Super Tux Cut, which is a super cute open source game. Uh, we're going to play against a few bots as well. So what we're going to do is let's apply that fleet. Tuxcut, fleet.yaml, and we've already containerized this game server as well. So we've got it uh, already built inside a Docker file. We can have it running. It's uh, Agonis itself actually has an SDK to manage some of the lifecycle components, like that long startup time for game servers. Um, and so we can actually see that in action right here. So if we say get game servers, uh, we can now see we have two game servers running. They're both in state ready. So they've loaded up all their assets and all their map information, everything they need. And we have an address and port. Uh, we can also see this at the fleet level. Uh, you can see here we have a super tux cut fleet uh, and it has you know all of them are ready and waiting to go, which is super nice. Now, we were also talking a lot about uh, that whole experience of how do we know whether there are players on there and making sure we manage that there are players and whether or not we can remove or delete or assign those kind of game servers. So the game services they currently are, they've spun up, they've loaded up all their assets. Uh, we can actually see that there are pods backing that as well. So we manage that pod lifecycle for you in the, in the back end. Um, they have the same name, so it makes things really simple to look at. And it's ready. Okay, so we've, we've loaded all our data and all our assets. Perfect. So how do we know whether or not a player is going to play on them? So we have a, a concept inside Agonos of what we call allocation, which is basically a thing that says, hey, from a particular pool of game servers, and there are a bunch of filtering options. Give me one of those game servers, mark it as allocated, and that means that I know that this game server has been designated to have players on it, and I'm not gonna shut that down until it self shuts down, either through its internal SDK, or like I'm very explicit about it. So let's actually look at that in action as well. So um, example, super tuxka game server, whoops, game server allocation. Uh, and I'm just going to spit out the result. This is um, a little less declarative than what you're probably used to inside uh, a Kubernetes. This is actually more of an imperative command. We're actually trying to send an allocation, but this is still just a, like a custom resource definition like you would expect normally. So I'm just going to do an allocation. It's going to go through that fleet that we saw previously, and it's going to give me back a game server, which we saw right here. Uh, if we actually look at that in a different way, so we can see that there's one of those particular game servers we have we have our address, right? And we have our port information. We can see it's allocated. If we also look at it, uh, GS is just shorthand for a game server. Now we can see one of these is allocated and one of these is ready. So why don't we grab the allocated one uh, and we'll actually play a game. So let me go over to Super Tux Cart. We're gonna run that. That will pop open a window. I'm just gonna move that over to the right-hand side. We're going to go online, enter a server address. We'll just paste that in there. Click OK. So this is connecting to the GKE cluster I have running in the cloud uh, directly to this pod. Um, it, is, it is not going through a load balance or anything like that. That's just the way game servers work. Um, and it is set up and ready to go. You can see I'm, I'm sitting there. So let's actually also uh, set up some, we're going to have some friends come and join us. I'm just going to pull this down for a sec. We're gonna add some. We're gonna add some bots to the equation. There we go. Now we can see we have some bots. Excellent. Okay, let's start our race. Uh, I'm gonna be. Uh, we'll be Tux. I think that's that's a good choice. And then we'll choose a thing. We'll choose one of those races. And so, yeah, so these bots are also connected from my machine. Um, obviously, you know, if we we're playing an actual game with people, then they would join from their own computers but I'm able to set up control and orchestrate these game servers just from within the system. So we'll play a little, we'll play for a little bit here. All right, zoom in, uh, let's see how we go. I don't wanna collect that. Um, and you're right, as you can see, I'm playing this game and so far I'm winning, which is also super nice. Oh, and I'm in all. Anyway, you can see the game happening. So uh, I want to have a look at one other thing, right? So you can see there's that gameplay experience. That's super nice. I'm going to do that. Uh, if I come back here, you'll actually notice we have a look at our game servers. In one second, there we go. You'll actually notice that they're both backed already. And the reason for that is, is actually the way Super Tux Cart works is you play a game. Once everyone's exited, that game server will shut itself down. 
Uh, and that fleet will make sure to make sure that there's always that regular number, that designated number of game servers always ready and ready to go so that I can keep continuing to allocate from that set. You can see here, right, the age of this one is 15 seconds versus this one. But I wanna try show you one more thing that's also really important. So let's, uh, let's allocate another game server real quick. Because we talked about this before, and this is one of the really important things about how Gonis works and how game servers work, because we don't want to shut down game servers that have players on them. We can see here that we have now one game server that is allocated. We have players on it. So I just want to highlight for you the capabilities that are necessary within Agones and with game server management as a whole to ensure that this game server never gets interrupted. So if I want to actually scale this fleet, for example, uh, back down to say zero, uh, for whatever reason, maybe I don't like this particular fleet. Um, I need to make sure that I don't interrupt any player experience. This is super important. So Agonis takes care of this. It has its own sort of scaling mechanisms and the way it manages this stuff in, the, in its warm set of fleets of game servers. So that now if we look at our game servers, we can see here that that allocated game server is still running and won't go away until it explicitly gets shut down. This means I can do things like rolling updates of new versions of game server fleets. I can do scale up and scale down operations, including auto scaling with impunity, knowing that um, at no point am I going to interrupt that player experience. This is quite different from other sort of workloads, say databases or web servers. And so there does need to be very specific tooling for specific game server workload type stuff, just because they have a very different lifecycle management system. All right. so. Cool. Uh, is this a silver bullet? No, of course not, right? <laughs> There's no silver <laughs> bullet. So, uh, so you might be wondering, it's like, okay, fine. It's like, what is what, what can be harder with uh, if we follow that, right? If we use the game server and the container. Uh, we can think of three. Uh, there may be more. Like the first one is if you have a game server that that deals with its own kind of control and logic, like an example is like, oh, if you have a server that's that spins up sub processes, um, and then you kind of manage the lifetime of those sub-processes. Uh, you push certain processing into those sub-processes. Um, all of those things. Uh, essentially, like if you if you want to follow the, the pattern that we just talked about, it's like it means that you have to port that into uh, Kubernetes, which you know it's possible, um, but it's just a bit tricky. Kind of depends on on your logic. Um, the other one is if your game server is highly highly tuned to specific hardware chip, it, it makes things a bit harder. Um, in order to, to take advantage of this. Uh, and the last one is, again, this is not impossible. Um, if your game server is, is, is only runs on Windows and you cannot convert it to Linux, for instance, uh, it, it makes things a bit harder. Um, by experience, uh, I know that I know some teams that have tried to run a Windows game server on Wine so that they can containerize it on Linux. Uh, with varying degrees of success. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. Awesome. So to wrap things up, like what are some of the lessons we can learn here about containerizing game servers? So I just basically, if you want to take away anything from here, I recommend use containers so you can stand on the shoulders of giants. There's so much work that exists out there for running game servers at scale um, you can take advantage of, as well as just running software at scale that you can take advantage of. Please. Don't reinvent the wheel. Please don't redo this all over again. Uh, there are so many amazing tools that you can take advantage of. So please do. Ray? Yep. So for me, it will be kind of depends on what, what you need, what, what is the best for your players. So kind of start with that first. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, like if you can actually use uh, the existing toolings and things like that, please don't reinvent the wheel. Fantastic. Uh, if people are interested in learning more, they can follow us both on Twitter. Uh, I am at Neurotic. If you want to hear more about the Ghanes project, you can go to agones.dev. Um, if you're interested in running uh, Ghanes clusters at scale in a multi-cluster way and still want to be able to do that in a really nice hands-on way and have the power of customization, the Google Cloud Game Servers project is a management layer that sits on top of that. But Ray, why don't you tell us a bit more about what you all do uh, over at Excel Bytes because you have some amazing stuff there as well. Cool, yeah. So uh, again, that's my Twitter name, Ray Arifianto. Uh, check us out in excelbyte.io. Essentially, we we are we make a one-stop shop for game developers that want to use online uh, services, online capabilities. So check out what we have. Uh, specifically for game servers, check out our Armada page, where basically we built uh, our orchestration layer of game servers on top of Agonis. 
And what we do are basically for game developers who don't want to provision your own Kubernetes and kind of manage and all that, right? It's like, uh, I just want a solution. I just want a service. I want a matchmaking. And then I want something that I can spin up my game servers. And then so we use that. Fantastic. So a little bit of everything for everyone. Indeed. Well, Ray, thank you so much for doing this presentation with me. I hope everyone here enjoyed it. Uh, and thank you so much for spending time with the both of us today.